Welcome back to the Disc Connected, and I am here with Phil Hopkins and Crystal from the Film Masters. Thank you both for joining me today. Good to be here. I am. I'm thrilled to have you here. Uh, one thing that I probably should start with is Film Masters is uh, a new venture for for you. And what we had before was the Film Detective that you were associated with, correct? Uh, for those that have not uh, been able to read too deep into Film Masters yet, hopefully the quality from the Film Detective stuff will make you very confident in what is coming from Film Masters because, oh my God, were these releases incredible. Love the way this one looked, but I think that my favorite release from the Film Detective yet was The Bat. You guys did astonishing work on this release. Thank you. Yeah, it's only for it, love. <laughs> Gifts, gifts to the universe. Oh, absolutely. And I, I'm i a big Vincent Price person. So when that got announced, I was just giddy. Uh, any any interesting stories on the background of getting the elements for the bat and all that? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about the bat itself, we had put it out um, previously. And what, <laughs> little did we know that we would be doing physical media forever. Um, and thank God, right? Thank God for people like you, Ryan, for, you know, making physical important again. And, and actually, you've, you've seen this amazing resurgence of boutique labels, um, and it's because of the community. And so when, when we were in that world, um, and again, I come out of it from doing home video for over 20 years through right. every iteration, but the, the whole mass merchant going into big box retail and that was that was done and so we were approached um by allied vaughn who was introducing mod and they said hey no inventory you you, you sell one you sell a thousand it, it won't matter you're not on the hook to make you know a gazillion pieces of the dvds or the blu-rays so our first release of the bat was mod through allied vaughn that was probably i don't know 2015 2016 Right. And ironically, it was our last release as as the film detective. Um, but we were really happy with that because our friend Carl Amari uh, has an amazing old time radio collection. And he does a lot of these um, podcasts. And he, in fact, he was doing podcasts for film detective uh, as old time radio. And Vincent Price, as you probably know, did a ton of radio shows. So the, the cool thing about that Blu-ray was we packed it um, with a lot of the, the old-time radio performances from Vincent Price. Yeah, there's some great features on here, and I'm I'm just glad to see that all of the, the quality standards are continuing to film masters because it's kind of what sets the film detective apart for me uh, when it was uh, going on because some of these films, obviously, they're – they're not getting a lot of love through these other boutiques. A lot of them aren't going to focus on the 1930s Scarlet Letter, we'll say, and release that on, you know, Severin Films or something. So I, I'm glad that somebody's doing it and getting it out there. Uh, so why, if you can share, why, why the move from Film Detective to Film Masters? Uh, we sold the company. And at, at first we thought we were selling our company to another indie company that loved what we did and what we were all about. Um, it wasn't the case. Um, so we kind of decided to reinvent ourselves as film masters since film detective is no longer, uh, it's gone to, <laughs> I don't know where it's gone. I don't know what will happen. It will probably, um, I don't know. Good question. But Film Masters is just the continuation, you know, of what we were trying to do. Um, see, we thought there was a community of people like like us that loved vintage film that wanted to be involved with film restoration. But the bottom line is all the corporations don't give a rat's ass about film preservation. Even the, even the major media companies um, that you'd hope would care about it. If you just look at what happened with Turner Classic Movies over the past yeah. couple of months, that was a huge, massive gut punch for so many people. So, um, yeah, at the end of the day, it just comes down to people like yourself and all the, you know, helping hands that, you know, really give um, this genre, what we call genre film. I, I don't even know what that means. It's just film. I mean, it's, right. it's classic movies, whether it's from the 20s or from the 90s. I mean, it's uh, a community of people that love this stuff. And that's what we're counting on going forward is building that community and, and including other people. 
it's not just about being a company and putting stuff out and trying to, you know, it's just, it, it's really about a community. And that's why what we're doing is a little bit different now. We're trying to be less, oh, let's go build an app. Let's go try to be media and, you know, right. just core stuff, the core stuff that we're really good at. And then the contributors that really, you know, like working with us and we like working with, and then building off of that and taking it very slow and gradually, hopefully putting out more stuff. And, but yeah, that's kind of, we had big ambitions with film detective. We thought we could, you know, create something pretty important with classic film, with preservation, with the archives and technology. But at the end of the day, you know, it's just the sausage factory grinding out, you know, the sort of lowest common denominator. All powered by greed at the end of the day, it seems like. Uh, I, I got to admit, um, I've got a, a Patreon for my channel, and we have this really tight Discord where we discuss a lot of these announcements all the time. And Film Detective was really popular on our Discord, especially for a few of us. It was a, a, a small label that seemed to get very little attention. And then when it came out, it was, oh my God, how does this look so incredible? And how is nobody else talking about this? And there was those couple months in between the bat and before Film Masters was revealed, what's going on with Film Detective? We got to see what's going on. Are they silent? What's 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 happening? Uh, and then there was the questioning at the beginning of Film Masters looks, you know, the branding looks sort of similar. It sounds like they've, they've got the same sort of vibe going on. And then when we finally realized it was going to be the same quality and same passion behind it, that was one of the biggest reliefs that I felt in a long time because I could tell that that love was still going to be there. So thank you for continuing. Thank you. Thank you for supporting it and loving this. And, and you're, and, and you're right. I mean, even, even for Crystal and myself, just to be able to kind of put the band back together and get some of the former contributors that we, we loved working with. I mean, this stuff right. is a labor of love, right? And n not having that in the mix and then deciding, you know, how do we do it again, but do it a little bit differently, but do it the same without repeating it and, it was all those nuanced things, right? Like, you know, even, you know, working with Daniel again, um, with Bellyhoo, uh, that's such a significant part of our releases. And and the team of people that everything from the authoring to the liner notes and, you know, it, it's it's a, it's a, a lot of work to sort of put that level of care and attention into one release. You know, it's not like we're, able to crank these out every week and right. and even having those assets ready it's you, you think you just got through saying our distributor mvd five months you'd think that would be plenty of time to get the, everything to the warehouse on time and you have you know a, a buffer you know here we are with our debut release and it's a month before street date and the stuff just got there interesting interesting uh, so before we dive into the current and future iteration of Film Masters, can we go into backgrounds a little bit? Uh, I mean, you've been talking about how you've been doing this for 20 years. Can you share what, what all you've done throughout the last 20 years? Because that's a big time chunk when it comes to physical media and film in general. The the, the landscape has changed kind of dramatically in that time. Yeah, it, it, it certainly has. So when I started doing... First of all, I never thought of this as something you could do professionally and actually do for a living. I don't think I don't know if you even can today. It's more of a sort of boutique, and ho hopefully you've got the resources. Um, but there was a time when putting out physical DVDs and things of that nature um, could you could make a decent living, and that was because there was so much available that for home video when dvd became the format and sort of the first release that i ironically the first release one of the first releases i put out was 23 years ago i put out a dvd of the terror and little shop of horrors on standard definition dvd from 16 millimeter prints and we thought that was the cat's meow Holy cow, we can actually put two movies on a DVD um, together and press it into this cool format that's not tape, that's going to not get jammed into your tape player. Um, and then ironically, here, flash forward <laughs> 20, 23 <laughs> years later, and our last release of 2023 is The Little Shop of Horrors and The Terror. And the Terror. That's amazing. So, yeah, it's, you know, we've, we've done this for so, for so long, but 
my God, if, if I knew 23 years ago, the resolution and, and working in 4K and having film scanners and being able to do digital restoration and take all these right. imperfections and have things look even better than they probably look theatrically, because a lot of these films didn't have many release prints when they run around to various movie theaters. So by the time they got from point A to point B, the prints were, you know, all scratched up and beat up. So you look at yeah. some of the films that I grew up watching on UHF channels that were in syndication and then as a collector getting 16 millimeter film prints and then go into collector shows and buying VHS tapes of a lot of early horror films that were hard to find. Uh, it's it's truly remarkable that the level of quality that comes out now, that the, the resolution, uh, it, it's it's exciting. But you know, this it's not like this hasn't been a format. Um, Blu-ray's been around for a long time, but I think with with collectors in these sort of new initiatives, the boutique and and and, and the pressure today is a different pressure because back then if you were selling you were going into retail stores like barnes and noble and borders books and music and and then if it didn't sell the, the stuff came back so you, you you might ship a couple thousand pieces but sometimes those you know the things came back and then you'd have to pay the replicator and you have to pay so this is actually an easier um sort of distribution chain because you know that a lot of the people who are ordering these are they're online places and they're not necessarily big box retailers. They're going to ship back a thousand pieces, um, but you still have to know. And then, then if you, you don't order enough and then, and it's not like these are, you know, dollar DVDs, you know, we're putting out right. 23 page booklets. So you have to get it right. And then you think you get it right. Then you find you have to get do a reorder two weeks before you're going into the <laughs> Which it's we true. love reorders, but <laughs> it does uh, mess up the operations a little. <laughs> well, speaking of you, uh, how'd you get into this, Crystal? Um, so I have not been doing this for 20 years. I, really? <laughs> shocker, <laughs> I know. Um, but I have been doing this, I think, I was thinking this morning, for eight years. Um, so, yeah, and that whole time, basically, I've been working uh, for Phil and with uh, the iterations of his companies. Um, but I started as a graphic designer right out of college and nobody thinks the job they get out of college is gonna become their career job. Right. Uh, so I just very happily fell into this world and have always loved film, but then had my eyes open to classic film and the importance of preserving uh, really history that a lot of my peers don't know and aren't talking about. And so, for me, it's been, um, you know, I, I've navigated from graphic design into operations to now doing a little bit of everything. But I think it's just like every day I learn something new and it's so fascinating um, to it really uh, to get to talk to all these contributors uh, to our discs because these are people who, you know, in 10 or 20 years, I'm not, I won't be able to just call them up and listen to stories right. or, uh, you know, just call Phil and be like, hey, what did Sam Sherman say for, for this release? <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, I'm very happy to have fallen into this world eight years ago. And even in the last eight years has seen some crazy evolutions. I mean, look at, you know, streaming eight years ago was, it, it existed, but nowhere near the iteration that it's at today. And, uh, you know, there are some people speculating it's, you know, plateaued and we're, we're on a little bit of a downfall for a little bit now, but, um, curious you know with with both of your perspectives how do you how do you feel that these last uh we'll, you know we'll say 20 years for you phil what, what do you think has been some of the the major changes that is going to shape the immediate future for us because home video obviously it's been told it's on its deathbed for what 27 years now or something <laughs> yeah but they they said that about the vinyl industry too right, right? so i think with the collectors, and this is where the, the, the iterations do change in terms of um, buying things at a big mall store versus getting things through a, a boutique company in, in, in an online sort of environment. And, and that's going to be very different. Um, but I think you're right. I think that, you know, when, when we started um, getting into streaming, oh, man, I, I think... We, I we think it was our, right when I started. It was, it was eight years ago. 
Yeah, wow. it was the <laughs> first day of work. <laughs> can you, can you uh, figure out how to work this platform, this partner that we're doing? And, uh, you know, I'm all sitting there thinking, what's a streaming app? I've only heard of Netflix. Like, what's right. the only thing? <laughs> Exactly. And that's and that's right. So we were building what we thought was the future, the way we were going to survive out of the death of home video and yeah. find a way to keep, you know, surviving in this sort of new landscape. So we we got into the concept of building a classic movie genre film app and you know, I think what was it, twenty eighteen, twenty yeah, probably yeah, right at the end of twenty released like twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen. It yeah. took me a couple months to figure out what was going on. <laughs> Wasn't a day one venture, got it. Yeah. <laughs> but we always we always felt like this would be the future of surviving and actually having a way to promote our films and what we were doing with partners and then all the institutions that we're uh, pulling film out of and hopefully putting film back into. Right. Um, so we thought that that was going to be the wave right and then in and around the time that we were building the film detective app um turner partnered up with criterion and they came out with filmstruck which we thought was this is great you know yeah. this is there's going to be 10 of these and this is going to be a very healthy environment and this is how we all survive out of the transition from home video into streaming well you know eight months after they announced filmstruck they they said they were going to close it down i said yeah. this is insane you know, they've got Criterion, they've got all these important Hollywood directors supporting this. Why would they, it's just, there's no logic to it. But then you realize the more you're in sort of this sausage factory, crank it out environment, nothing makes sense because right. it's all, you're dealing with people who are not cinephiles or fans of this and they don't even know the tactile nature of preserving and scanning film and taking care of it and forget, you know. So, that's when we said, well, maybe we'll be that company that can sort of carry it forward. Um, and we and, and, and we got heavily into building the app and building uh, a marketing plan to get to the various, you know, like Apple TV and Amazon and Roku and all that stuff. And Crystal was probably, you know, working both as a designer and also working as a, an app developer to get all this. This is sort of learn as you go. I've always said, you know, no matter what you do in any sort of profession, learn how to be the maitre d', the cook, the waiter, the dishwasher, do everything, soup to nuts. And thank God, you know, she did that because when we started Film Masters, you know, we, we've got even a smaller team, but we're all wearing 20 hats. Right. Um, but we did think that streaming was going to sort of carry us into the next iteration. And then ironically, when we sold the company and then it went into this sort of giant portfolio of, you know, multiple channels and all these things that are, you turn on your Roku device and it's just, you, 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 your, your brain starts to turn into mush because you can't even understand why there's all this stuff. There's no rhyme or reason. It's right. just a sea of titles and there's no curation. There's no contextual engagement um and then you just realize this is ridiculous you, you know with the, with the blu-ray you can do the commentary you can do the, the booklet you can keep it forever and if they don't take down that title from the streaming app or if the app goes away and things you know so um yeah i mean while i still think streaming is important ryan i think having physical media is more so because the collectors want to you know what we've learned what we've learned is that the collectors still want something they still want something just like in back of you and back of me you know we're we're collectors we want this stuff um it doesn't mean that we you can't come out with a streaming app again at some point and do it right. well um i think at some point next year we would like to work with other providers of media and say hey you've got a great library we've got a great library let's combine them and, and make a sort of boutique streaming app that doesn't necessarily have to be part of a bigger company that's going to screw it up and then we can create more incentives where you know the, the the physical media and the streaming become you know kind of together in some way where you get as a subscription maybe you get certain Things like a free DVD or a free Blu-ray is part of the, you know, there's creative ways to do it well. And I think we've learned enough, um, especially, you know, working with a, a larger 
cog in the wheel mentality with an, another company of all the pitfalls and all the people who really they're just looking to put the lowest common denominator into all these devices. Um, I, I think at some point, something that looked more like what Turner tried to do with Criterion um, can exist in the future, but it's going to require uh, everyone to work together and support it. And I don't think you can have 10 of them. I think you can have a couple, right. um, but just, you know, it, it, the mainstream media has shown they don't really care about classic cinema and genre films enough to put them into all the mainstream. I mean, you don't see the stuff on Hulu or Paramount Plus right. or all the big, even Amazon. You go on Amazon Prime and it's a complete mess. You've got, we, we, we might spend a ton of money restoring a film and good luck getting Amazon Prime to take that version if they've got 20 versions of another movie of lesser quality. So there's no, there's little to no communication with a lot of these big companies that are just taking, you know, <laughs> it, it, it needs to change but i think the way it can change is for us to continue to put out um great blu-rays and work on our blog and work on the editorial and then over time you know maybe that will show the industry you know you can do this well as as a small boutique company and then that can exist on a larger scale and if not i think the technology will then change where it won't matter. We won't necessarily need a major company. You can do it just by being your own technology and then just making it right. available to just like you do through the Blu-ray boutique market. Well, and, you know, we just talked about the the learn as you go mentality and with with an industry that, you know, a lot of the people that have worked in this industry for the last 30 years have never said this is dying because they see the, the diehards on the inside that are doing this uh, as part of their everyday life, like me, sadly. Uh but um, the, the people that are supporting this mean so much that they are learning as they go and evolving. I mean, literally sometimes on like a daily basis. So when you're learning as you go, things are changing. What existed four years ago pre-pandemic isn't the same as today. What existed 10 years ago is dramatically different. And what existed 20 years ago feels like it's on a different planet altogether. It's, it's wild. I can't imagine five years from now it's going to be entirely different. I'm just amazed that we're still able to have an audience for a lot of these films on physical media. To me, that it's reassuring. Um, and then with everything that we're trying to think about doing for next year, it's also kind of frustrating because we're already we've we've completely put every title into the mix that we're putting out in 2024. <laughs> and I wish we had 10 more sort of film master companies to put the other 40 title right. um that's the other the thing is that you, you really can't over release um there's so much involved with each release from the publicity to marketing to the building the right kind of packaging with the special features and the booklet and all the contributors um yeah i mean i, I i'm impatient i'd love to see a way to sort of get more because it's also as to crystal's point a lot of the people we work with they're not, they're not kids. Right. That's, that's very true. This is one thing that I've talked about a lot fairly recently, actually. And it's the fact that to these, to these releases, the most important part to me nowadays, like I love the films, but the special features are what sell it for me entirely. A lot of these films, yes, you can go stream the film. No one is doing special features on a wide scale. No, no studio is paying for the director of this film they just licensed from 1971 to talk about it for HBO Max. Nobody is putting that kind of love into it. And when you don't do that, you're losing the voice of the actors that were in it. You're losing the voice of, you know, perhaps there's some incredible story from the casting director that talked to 27 people before they cast their main lead and they can tell that whole story. And many of these discs feel like film school in a box. And You've you've shown that you can do that. Some of your your common contributors, I mean, C. Courtney Joyner, uh, Jason, you, you've got all kinds of great people. It, where did those bonds come from? Because it feels like there's this wonderful mutual trust between you and your collaborators. Well, I think um, uh, well, a lot of our contributors, Phil has has known for a long time. I think, and that's how it started. Yeah. Um, but then a lot of our contributors are just fans or friends of Daniel and they've reached out to us and uh, I've spent a lot of time on the phone. Phil spent a lot of time on the phone, just talking to them and building that trust. So we, we can get to a point where um, 
you know, Courtney called me for a release we're working on and it's like, hey, this is out of the box. Can I do this concept and link, uh, do this linkage? And I was like, yeah, that that is kind of, you know, a different thing. But I think that's something people really appreciate. Just take your idea and run with it. And, yeah. you know, I, I think that's built from trust is I, I know that Courtney is not going to put anything out that, uh, <laughs> you know, people wouldn't appreciate. And it's it's giving him and, and others that creative freedom to just kind of explore whatever rabbit trails uh, that we really get the gold from. Yeah, we're Which, really lucky. I mean, I think that, and if you look at the group of individuals, um, including someone like Tom Weaver, I mean, I was a huge fan of his stuff, you know, going back decades ago. So having people like that, Sam Sherman, you know, as a little kid, I remember watching his films when I was 12 years old on Saturday mornings on the sort of goofy creature feature show when they showed Dracula versus Frankenstein. I said, this is just, you know, it, it, the fact that he had people like J. Carol Nash that were, you know, and John Carradine and actors that I remember from really old films, the fact that Sam had actually given them and repurposed them in his films and then talking to him on a daily basis about different titles or different stories. And it, it we're, we're, we are so blessed to have all of the group of people that orbit what we do. Um, and that's really what we miss when, when we started film detective, this was the part we loved the most um, working with everyone from people who worked in the archives to authors and writers and contributors um, because they care so much about this stuff. It's one thing to want to put out a yeah. film and restore it, but to do it with a group of individuals that are equally as passionate about it, that bring all of that enthusiasm to the project. That's, you know, that's what we missed so much. And that's kind of why we're, we're really excited to be back at it. Um, and, and every day that I talk to a lot of these people, I'm just like, you know, Hey, you don't, you don't know when the last day is going to happen. I, I've lived at this point long enough through every different iteration. And I look back on certain people and um, even just as a, as a kid collecting film and going through kind of that phase of, as a hobbyist, right. You just look back and say, you know, I'm glad someone like Crystal, you know, is still in the mix. Who's young enough, who is now learning about things um, can bring it forward because 20 years from now, you know, who's going to remember a lot of this stuff. That's true. And, and one of the things that shows through the film detective stuff and what you have coming through film masters is that passion, that attachment. I mean, not, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, you know, 15 years ago, there was plenty of companies that would release here's 50 creature features on, you know, 10 DVDs. And they're just haphazardly thrown together because they got a bunch of licenses and they'll sell these for $25 and, People will buy them because they watch them as a kid. But when you have these in hand and you can see uh, a booklet and read about the creation of this film, you can read about the cultural impact. You can feel, you know, the what Phil had to go through to find this film and be able to restore it. Like that, that means something to a lot of people nowadays. It's it was kind of glossed over for a long time, but I feel like we're finally getting some of that real appreciation on a more like wholesale consumer level. Uh, it's true. I mean, if you think about just sort of, you know, I mean, for me, um, I've, I'm, at a, I'm at the point where I realized that film, film collecting that ultimately became film hoarding, you know, you kind of, you get to that moment, the epiphany where you say, hey, you know, when I'm gone, who's, who's, who's going to come take this away and deal with it? So, um, th we've built an appreciation for, all the major archives and what we've tried to do is is leverage what we love in terms of film preservation releasing film like we're releasing but more importantly getting things into major archives so there's not a big dumpster in a truck at some point right. I've, I've been that guy pulling up in a 51 foot semi and you know it's sad when you look at a fine grain of white zombie with all the contracts from the original producers. And that's sitting on a concrete floor and it's fused together like a hockey puck. Um, so much has been lost because of neglect 
and films that were just not, you know, well cared for. And I'm dealing with this right now. I've been dealing with this for uh, over the past year with the Wade Williams Library. Um, we had a great thing going for, you know, putting out Wade's releases and working with Paramount on certain restorations that they were participating in. And then Wade passed away. And we're now dealing with the reality of, you know, someone who collected thousands of film prints um, and then trying to make sense of it and manage it and get it into a proper facility. I mean, this is the it's a strange, weird, blurry line when you're a film collector and a film enthusiast, because I've met so many people, Ryan, that have thousands of films in basements and attics and storage buildings and things like that. Um, and then you realize, how does this stuff actually stay relevant, stay available? Um, and that's if it's well cared for. Um, so we're trying really hard to make sure that everything that we get our hands on ends up in a good home, whether it's the Library of Congress, UCLA Film and Television Archive, the British Film Institute, the Academy of Motion Pictures, the Eastman House, these are the places where films should be ultimately, not in my attic or my basement. It's, it's one thing if you have a common print that, you know, it's everyone's going to have a copy of that. Um, but if it's a significant film um, or it's even like some of these lower budget B grade films or poverty row films, very little is left of this stuff. I mean, it's truly miraculous that we've been able to release something from Majestic Pictures, from the original camera negative. The, the Scarlet Letter that we're putting out in November, um, and again, if not for Sam Sherman taking care of the stuff and really loving a lot of these lesser known studios like Majestic, um, having access to an original camera negative from, from a film from Poverty Row from Majestic, it, it's unbelievable. And and you'd, you'd, you'd hope that the studio, the, the main studios, would right. care enough, like people like Sam and others that really believe that this stuff is valuable and has a significant piece in motion picture history. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's a huge win when you can get access to good elements, but it's not often that you find that, especially with poverty road films. I don't want to go down like a negative road, but are there any specific studios that you feel like? really are giving that sort of respect to some of these older films and archiving them properly and really heralding that, that idea of classic film. I think Paramount does an amazing job. Uh, we've worked with them on several of our releases as film detective with wave stuff. Um, flight to Mars was one and they did a phenomenal job helping get the preservation and the film 4k scan. And ultimately when we did final restoration, um, we never, ever would have had as great success with that release in terms of how it looked, if not for Paramount. So, yeah, they, they're they great. Um, but early early on, when the studios, and, and don't forget, like if you look at someone like MGM, they've gone through so many iterations of ownerships. So it's not like it's the original company uh, that made the films. Uh, you've got a whole different group of individuals and big, giant, Fortune 500 companies behind. They're not. They're not archivists or film preservation people. Paramount's great, um, but so much of what was years ago. If you think about early cinema history and silent film, most of those nitrate films were gone because the studios never saw the the long term value. In, once they went through their initial theatrical distribution, there was no syndication. Certainly, no no home video. Um, so a huge percentage of early cinema, and I think that's the hardest genre in general to get people to really pay attention to, is the silent era. There's so few titles that are that are still available um, because of the nitrate fires. Um, so when we do find something unusual, like the Scarlet Letter, we we know that horror films and 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 things that are more popular are going to be easier to promote and release and sell. Um, but I think it's equally important for us to put an emphasis on lesser known genres and certainly lesser known films um, because they're equally as good and important. Uh, and then the right. backstory in all these titles and then 
the studios too. I mean, a lot of those poverty row studios, if you look at Monogram and PRC, I mean, think of all the Lugosi films that came out of Monogram. Uh, they're, they're not as, as good as say the universal films in terms of quality, but I think with small budgets and having access to a, an actor like Bela Lugosi, I love those films and, 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 being able to get them out today into 4K and Blu-ray and have them look great, people appreciate them way more because they're not you're not seeing them on those low resolution 16 millimeter <laughs> right, right, reduction right. prints that, that are barely watchable. To go back to your point, Phil, of of you know balancing things, we know that horror will always sell well, um, but we were very intentional with the Scarlet Letter and even looking forward to 2024. It's, you know, we could have released 12 horror Blu-rays or, or planned to release 12 horror Blu-rays. But um, I think even when we were first sitting down with the start of Film Masters, we said, you know, let's, how do we balance the catalog? How do we uh, stagger these releases so that we don't just become the horror, like another horror company? Right. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we do really seek, I think, to preserve or curate things from all eras of film history and all genres. And and you can tell. And one of the things that I'm I'm really happy about, and you know, we talked about streaming earlier. I, I'm not anti-streaming necessarily because I think the most important thing here is the accessibility to all of it. So for everybody to have the ability to see these films, that's what makes it something close and, and near and dear to a lot of the people that are in this industry, their their hearts. But the, the ability to deliver this complete package is kind of unheard of for some of these films because they were so forgotten. And without like the film masters, who's going to do that for the Scarlet Letter? Really? Who, who's going to who's going to be able to package something like this with all of these people and put it out for the masses? I mean, that's that's incredibly important to to support and, and to see get done. I, I'm just thrilled that we're able to see that still happening in 2023. And again, having having access to the original, I mean, just the fact that the original camera negative to the Scarlet Letter exists, right, is amazing, mind blowing. And then, and thankfully, then if you look at someone like um, UCLA, who who helped with the preservation print that we ultimately scanned and made the you know 4K master from. Uh, it, it takes it takes all these institutions and all the people to to make this even viable and make it work. Um, just the photochemical process of making a new preservation print is incredibly costly. Um, well, yeah. that's just the feature. I mean, we we haven't talked about the extras of. <laughs> you know, Tom is emailing me at midnight and, oh, I found, um, you know, original camera negatives. I've, I've never looked at them before, never seen them before, but uh, wow. here's some stills from behind the scenes of Beast from Haunted Cave. Um, so it it's all, you know, yes, it's amazing what goes into the features and the preservation of that and all the partners, but it's also amazing all the partners that help with the special features like... Um, for the Scarlet Letter, we have something narrated by John Carradine. Well, <laughs> that didn't, you know, we obviously didn't shoot that today. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> uh, so with Build Masters, we've got, uh, I think we've got four titles announced so far. First one coming out, we're almost exactly a month from the release right now. We've got the giant Gila monster uh, with the killer shrews as a B-side on that. Beast from Haunted Cave with the ski troop attack B-side there. The Scarlet Letter, and then again December, the Terror with Little Shop of Horrors. Um, these just great. First of all, I'm I'm always happy to see that bonus feature to try to entice more people to really see this is like a full package. You're actually getting your money's worth with these. Um, but some of these titles, I feel like they could have been their own release too. Like Ski Troop Attack, people have been dying to see a good version of that for a long time. I, I saw people super excited the day that that got announced. Yeah, I mean, to Phil's point earlier, we would release 24 titles a year if we could. So <laughs> maybe this is, um, you know, I, I know we have our other reasons, but I think part of it was that we do just want to get these titles out and in circulation again with a good print. But right. Phil can probably speak more to that. I mean, we've learned so much, too, just even with these releases. Um, I mean, with Gila Monster and Killa Shrews, um, 
we we were really hoping to do something theatrically, right? You know, <laughs> like in our brains, we were thinking, you know, there should be a, there should be a red carpet event. I mean, yeah. with all the work that's gone into this, we were really, um, how do we make something, especially as our debut, you know, how do we do something? Um, and, and, and out of the blue, we, we received an email from someone from Dallas, Texas. Huge fan of the film, found a venue, very cool venue, excellent looking movie theater that embraced the idea of us not only showing Gila Monster, but showing the Killer Shrews a week later. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and this is when you really get excited when and you find those people in the world that are as excited about this release as the rest of us who are willing to reach out, just cold calls and say, Hey, can I, can I do an event? Can I book a movie theater and have a special event? And could you guys participate? I'm like, are you kidding? We've been dreaming about this. We've, we've been trying to figure out how to do it. So awesome. Gila monster in its 4k glory will be screened very close to where it was originally filmed. Um, and we're doing it a, a two-week um, back-to-back giant Gila monster, Gila monster, however you want to say it. And uh, the week after that will be the Killer Shrews. And uh, it's at a very cool venue um, in Dallas. Um, yeah, no. So we're we're thrilled. I've, and 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 even now for Beast from the Haunted Cave, we're thinking, hmm. Can we find a place in Deadwood, South Dakota to find a uh, screening for Beast? <laughs> Projected on the side of a, a hill or something. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, we could do it in the cave. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, one of the things that is super exciting that uh, I think I've seen probably the most amount of feedback so far is you put up a preview of the restoration for the Crippled Masters. Um, first off, the video itself that you posted... I think this is one of the most important things that boutiques should be doing more of, and that's showing what the restoration process is delivering. I don't think people understand how much work that actually entails and frame by frame, you know, removing of dirt and, and getting rid of, you know, 70 years of storage on some of these titles. It is astonishing how much better that film looks from the raw scan. Uh, can you can you talk to the process that went behind that and maybe any idea of uh, what's going to be coming with that release? Well, first of all, that title was un and believable to find in the first place. So um, we do a lot of work with Turner Classic Movies when it comes to oddball films that they can't obtain from the studios or through their normal channels. And I've been doing that with Charlie Tabish for, you know, probably close to 15, 20 years now. When he asked me about Cripple Master, my head exploded when I actually found out what the film was. Um, and again, you, you say, where do you find these films and how do you find them? I had gone online when the, the network was talking about licensing it. And, and this film just didn't exist. You know, good luck finding any version of it. Uh, sure, it was on YouTube, um, but actually getting a 35 millimeter copy of it <laughs> i found that there was a, a theater in copenhagen in denmark that had screened it in 19 or 2018 wow as part of a midnight movie marathon or something of that nature reached out to the venue emailed them and asked them about it and they said oh well yeah, that print, that was uh, so-and-so, that was Jack, you know, uh, he, here's his email address. Great, okay. Got in touch with the guy who projected the film, and I said, hey, I'm interested in getting, you know, your film. Is there any way I could borrow it, you know, buy it? Could you loan it? Um, and then found out, yeah, he's got the 35-millimeter print, and God knows what the condition is. Just the fact that he had it was just, to me, it was a miracle that I even right. found this guy. Um, and then the second big challenge was, well, does he ship it to me? Do we actually, how do we do this? Um, so I went online and then I had reached out to um, our friends over at the British Film Institute. And I said, what's the best way to get a film scanned? And, and they said, well, where is it? I said, it's in Copenhagen. They gave me a lead for a lab. The lab had closed. No lab. Of course. 
And then I found another place that wasn't a lab that was actually a pre-production studio facility and they had a film scanner. So I negotiated with them and then Jack, the fellow who actually had the film, <laughs> he didn't have a car. So he asked me, you know, uh, <laughs> can I, you know, would I pay him for a taxi to get to this place? <laughs> sure, whatever I have to do. <laughs> so we got the film, um, they scanned it, they made a 2K scan and this this was your classic grindhouse film that had been through 2000 projectors yep i mean you saw the before and after restoration demo and i just said this is unbelievable i don't know i don't even know if we can get it to be broadcast worthy um and we had a very limited time to do it um so they sent us the digital file and um and we ran it through, you know, our whole process, which we have like a 10 step restoration process, um, soup to nuts. And when I watched that on Turner, I sat down and I watched that live when they aired that. And I just could not believe how it looked. I said to myself, this is this is truly one of the most satisfying moments of the 20 years I've been working professionally in this industry. And, and I didn't even know. I said, you know, is there even an audience? I mean, I'd never heard of the film. I mean, I wasn't on my radar. And then we posted, uh, no, some actually the host, the guy who actually, because the film was on as part of a um, disability and film week that they had done on TCM. Yeah. And the, and the guy who actually wanted the film posted something on Twitter, I think, that night. And then I realized, like, holy crap, you know, what? People are totally into this film. Ooh. And then Crystal and I talked about, you know, maybe we should make this a Blu-ray and there seemed to be a lot of interest. And then we posted the before the before and after restoration. <laughs> you know, yeah. We realized we're definitely putting this out on Blu-ray. It again to reiterate for anybody that has not seen this, and, and all the links for Film Master stuff will be in the description below. So please go pour through all of these. But this video, it is hard to even describe how different these look it, it is it is clear night and day it's not one of those uh it's been stored in somebody's attic and it looks really great but like the coloring is off no this this went through every projection probably in like the whole continent for a while you can tell this thing was run ragged and it looks remarkable now it is astonishing what was able to be done on this i'm so happy that you were able to find it but for everybody that got to work on it i mean that has to be just this immense feeling of accomplishment to be able to save something like that. Well, you know, it's interesting, Ryan, a, a lot of people have asked us if we would include the unrestored version with yeah. the restore. And, and there's an aesthetic, there's an aesthetic to grindhouse, right? And, and I include martial arts films, Kung Fu films from the seventies in this sort of grindhouse category. Um, and even the kids today, when they make their music videos on TikTok, they introduce film artifacts as, you know, oh, look, you know, make it look old and cool and put retro film scratches and artifacts. And um, so I think that, yeah, I mean, it's certainly you'll get an appreciation for how much work was done. Um, but I think there is something interesting. It's, it's kind of like a vinyl. It's like a piece of vinyl. It's a, it's a record that you might have had from your childhood that you played a thousand times. You could hear it on Spotify. You could hear it on 5.1 audio. But that version, when you do a needle drop and you hear all the, you know, the time your, your dirty thumbprints are on it and you're, you know, picking it up and moving it and you're hearing all the little imperfections. There's something in Grindhouse particularly that people like about it. Um, even though we can make things look far better today with the technology that we have, I think there's a certain group in that category that, they don't mind imperfections as much. It's that that niche within a niche. Completely get that. Uh, I know there's many people like uh, Cauldron Films. They released City of the Living Dead earlier this year. They put the the SD like the VHS scan. Basically, they put that on the disc. And I, I'm thrilled. Like as many as many versions of it that we can get out there. Please let's preserve all of them. That those are those are real tangible experiences for many of these people that grew up with these films. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, and. The cool thing is that with what we're doing, I mean, let's, to get back a little bit on the Scarlet Letter, 
we have a featurette that Crystal was talking about that's narrated by John Carradine. Uh, that's called Salem and the Scarlet Letter. But the footage is Sam Sherman came to Salem, Massachusetts with his family and just walked around the House of Seven Gables and Hawthorne's birthplace and all these locations. And he has 16 millimeter camera. So this entire film with the narration by John Carradine, the footage is just Sam's footage of when he came to Salem on 16 millimeter. So the fact that we can repurpose this put the narration on it and make it into something brand new, even though it's 45 years old um, and have, and have that as a special feature. And then things, you know, like, you know, we're bringing back Easter eggs, you know, we're going to start doing things like that. I think it's, it's, it's a lot more entertaining than, you know, uh, sitting at home and watching, you know, the news cycle. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty depressing nowadays. Uh, Speaking of depressing, uh, the current state of physical media, we, we've had a really kind of crazy last month of physical media announcements and news that have come to light. There are things that people thought were like long impossible that are getting full blown announcements. Uh, people finding, you know, the OCN of Jess Franco's Count Dracula and Severin's putting that out in this glorious package. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, with your your background, obviously a lot of digital and streaming is still going to be in the future, but how do you, how do you feel about the future? Uh, other than the fact that it's a very collector's niche, do you think that we're ever going to see any sort of a, a, an increase in, in the production eventually? Because if streaming does start to decrease, which a lot of people are pointing at, you know, rising costs and losing so, some of their content out there, that it, it's quite likely that they could see a decrease in their market saturation. Do you think that home video might fill up some of that? I do. I, I, I certainly do. We've seen it. Crystal and I were working as a, you know two cogs in a, in a big media wheel for a couple of years. So there's not enough to sustain a lot of these sort of flavor of the week initiatives. Yeah. Um, and people who are fans of classic film, uh, they're willing to make an investment in getting these really great deluxe versions and having stuff that they care about. It's, uh, it's different. It's, it's different than what you're going to get on Disney plus or, you know, you're, I mean, and I think that there's only so much you can do with that. You, you buy your TV at Best Buy, you, you put it into your room and then people either want to watch a sporting event, the news or Netflix, you know, that's sort of what was common. You, you, you can't turn it on and have a sea of 6,000 streaming apps and just right. not going to work. It's the same. It's the same overall overwhelming experience that we had with cable and why that was a downfall. It's just going to come back the way it was on my opinion. Um, I mean, film masters, you've got these four titles announced, uh, anything about 2024 other than potential teaming up for streaming that you can talk about? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I guess we could talk a little bit about our uh, January release, which has not been announced yet. I'm sure the minute I put it into the system, everybody will know about it, <laughs> uh, as we were talking about frequently happens. Um, but we are we are releasing Devil's Partner and Creature from the Haunted Sea. Wow, nice. Another double feature, another genre double feature people will be th thrilled about. Which, which were actually released at the same time. So this, this will close our loop on our film group documentary series. So we've kind of staggered the film group documentary into, um, we've serialized essentially. Um, this will close the loop on, on our film group documentary series. And, 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 and Devil's Partner is mind blowing how amazing, how incredible that came out. But Creature from the Haunted Sea was, you know, like Ski Trip Attack. We didn't have great elements. Um, yeah. And we had really good luck finding a 35 millimeter original theatrical print. So uh, I don't think there has ever been the theatrical version of Creature from the Haunted Sea. There's always been that sort of television cut, just like just okay. like Beast from Haunted Cave. You had the TV version, which they later they went. Monty Hellman went and did a bunch of additional footage and cut it into this package for uh, television because 
Corman's company did a deal with um, Allied Artists. And um, so this will be the first time, to my knowledge, that there's been a proper 185 Creature from the Odyssey of the theatrical version. And we're very excited. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's sad because we had... Wade Williams had a 35 millimeter print of it, and then the middle reel, reel two, had a lot of problems. It had gone vinegar, and there were stabilization. We, could, we couldn't get the uh, the entirety of the film in 35, so we're cutting in um, certain elements, and that's why some sometimes you know people might be asking, you know, you're doing a 4K of the main title, why not the other? Well, it's because we didn't have. Right. entire film of 35 millimeter to do that we had a frankenstein out of it and um while it's going to look better than it ever has you know it, we didn't have perfect elements well and again accessibility at the heart of this at least we have it and that's that's the best way to get these out in the best possible format and and again better than they've probably ever looked in the mass market at least that's incredible um, I mean, thanks for revealing that. I, I'm stoked on that. And it's it's crazy that we're in this time of, you know, these films getting uh, preserved for, you know, the actual film itself getting preserved in its best case, but then preserved on home video. Uh, I mean, just this morning, I, we got an announcement. I never thought we'd see this massive box set of Coffin Joe uh, delivered from Aero Video and in, in something that, you know, people had been rumored that was lost in a fire years ago. So it, every day, it seems like we're getting these amazing first in a lifetime type of announcements well i spent you know when i was in my 20s going to chiller probably easily 100 200 dollars in coffin joe vhs tapes yeah so i'm that total demo for that box set and 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 you say to yourself it, it, it's and it's fun you, you know it's something you grow up loving and you know for me starting out with you know eight millimeter truncated castle films and then getting 16 millimeter reduction prints to be able to actually see things like a Coffin Joe box set in, in my lifetime is yeah. is phenomenal. And again, we were, we were talking about extras earlier. That that thing has extras like crazy. So it's it's nice to see a younger generation be able to to be uh, you know thrust into the world where they can discover this person that was iconic for an entire country. And the films that Film Masters is putting out, it's it's close to that sort of thing. These were iconic impactful films for a lot of people and i i hope it reaches some of these young younger generations we do too all right phil crystal thank you so much for your time today is there anything else i didn't ask that you'd like to share with everybody about film masters just um check us out at filmmasters.com and i'm sure um if you're a contributor if you're into what we do uh, we're always looking for people to be part of our editorial team, uh, whether it be for our blog or some of our um, YouTube channel features like Legendary Faces um, that we feature a certain iconic actor or actress and create these little mini documentaries. Um, yeah, you know, we're it's just a it's a huge giant group of film geeks and we're just trying to make it sustainable so we can keep doing it. And hopefully, uh, you know, a year from now, we'll have the next batch of 10 or 20 titles in the pipeline. Can't wait to see what's next. Thank you so much for your guys' time. And uh, like like Phil just said, everybody, all kinds of links in the description. Please go check them out. This is one of those companies that, uh, you know, if I could afford to support everybody, I would. But this is one that is important. This is the one that that film preservation is at the heart. And you can tell. And I, I just thank you guys for the amount of work you're doing. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Have a good one. Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share with someone else that may appreciate this.